I'm gonna show you how to write down uh, different infinities. The very first one is the uh, lazy eight symbol. So this was introduced to mathematics as infinity in the 17th century, one say John Wallace. Apparently it was used before and the term for this was a lazy eight, uh, which I really like. So this is just infinity. Just infinity, you say it like it's just a trivial thing. Yes. Now. Let's go back to the 17th century for a moment, step into the time machine if you will. At the time, mathematics as you know it was more computational. In a way, what you might expect mathematics to be, or you know, if you grab somebody in the street like, tell me what is mathematics? And they will tell you, well, it's computing things. This infinity symbol really just meant something that never ends and you know, continues. And then you can study vaguely how it works. So, you know, it tends to infinity, it gets closer to this value or so and so. So for example, one half, one third, one quarter, one fifth, and so on. If you go to infinity, it approaches zero. There's no point that you find zero in the sequence, but it gets closer and closer and closer to zero. In that sense, that was fine. When we arrive to the 19th century, in part because of so many other secular developments in the world, the concept of infinity becomes more tangible, in a sense, and people start asking, what if there's an actual object in mathematics that's infinite? So, for example, if you just write down the natural numbers, all right, so this is 0 and 1 and 2 and so on, but you can say, let me just put all of them into one big collection. So just one set, it contains all the natural numbers. We're not computing this set. We're not trying to build it slowly one step at a time. It just exists. It's just there. Then what? Right? And this was actually the start of set theory. And what can we say about this? It's an infinite thing. And we can actually talk about how many things are inside of it, right? So there are infinitely many. But the first thing Georg Cantor, who developed set theory, the first thing he noticed was there are different sizes of infinity. So not just different types or meanings to infinity, but actual different sizes. Some infinite things are strictly smaller than others. Famously, the natural numbers, if we put this absolute value to them, are strictly smaller than the real numbers, right? So the real numbers are all the numbers you can really think of. So um, pi and e, square root of five, and so on. On the other hand, this has the same size, if you will, as the complex numbers. So this is the real numbers, but also the imaginary unit, the square root of minus one, everything else that you can generate from this. So Cantor said, well, we need, these are new numbers. They, we need new symbol for this. Eventually, he settled on the Aleph notation. So Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And he used Aleph zero or Aleph not or Aleph null to denote the size of this natural numbers. So this is an infinity. And the real numbers turned out to be the size of it is two to the power of aleph naught. Okay. Right. Th we do know the correlation exactly. Yes. Right. Now, Cantor had made a why very. Two? Why two? Oh, that's probably well, it can be a lot of things actually. It could be three and four and five. It could also be aleph naught to the power of the aleph, aleph naught. Are those numbers are the same? All give you the same result. Why did you use two then? Just because it's the first number? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Cantor had noticed that there's two ways in a way to generate larger infinities. So this is why we have this zero here. Right? So there's Aleph one, which is the next largest infinity. Right? So there's nothing between them. And next to that, we have Aleph two. There's nothing between them. Yes. So two to the Aleph nor, or these ones here, yeah. they're smaller than Aleph one? No. no. So since this is larger than Aleph naught, yeah. right, then we have that Aleph one is less or equal than two to the Aleph naught. Right. And Cantor actually hypothesized that they are equal. 
This is uh, what he formulated as the continuum hypothesis. Famously, he tried to prove it for years on end uh, and failed. And after mathematics had been formalized and set theory had been written down into the axioms we know today, actually Paul Cohen and Kurt Gödel proved the two parts of this theorem. We cannot prove this and we cannot disprove this. So it's possible in some mathematical universe that they are equal, and it's possible in some mathematical universe that this is strictly greater than that. So when, so the, the real numbers, the set of the real numbers, what infinity are they? Are they, they're not aleph one, but, but maybe they are. Yeah. So there are two to the aleph naught. Yeah. Which is an exact value. Yeah. But where does it sit on the aleph kind of scale? We can't prove. Okay. We can, there's some limitations that we can say, oh, it can't be this or it can't be that. But those are very minor ones and it can be almost anything. What, is there anything that there is aleph one of or aleph two of or? So that's a great question. Um, it's hard to describe this, right? But uh, aleph one is in fact a size of something very concrete, very abstract, mind you, but in, in as far as concrete as you can get uh, in these kind of things. However, it's not something that you can describe by it's this collection of real numbers has size alpha one. So it's, it's not very simple to explain what it is. Uh, I'll say it in just two lines, because some of you might be interested. Uh, if you consider all the ways you can well order the natural numbers, And if you group them together by saying this is the same type of order, aleph one is the size of how many types you can get uh, from well ordering of the natural numbers. But it's not all the different ways you can rearrange them. It's not all it's the... It's not. No. That is actually two to the aleph naught. What number does alephs go up to? Do we get aleph 10, aleph 20? Exactly. So, you can keep going and going and going, and then eventually you reach something that we call Aleph Omega. Now, in some places, somebody might write Aleph, Aleph naught, because you've gone through all the natural numbers. So now... So that's Aleph infinity. Yes. Right. But the, there's a slight difference in the notation, which is a difference in context, which is why we use the Omega. And after this, you can put Aleph Omega plus one and Aleph Omega plus two and so on. So it's infinity, infinity plus one, infinity plus two, and all the way up to infinity plus infinity and further and further and further. There's no last Aleph, there's no largest Aleph. This just sounds like a kid saying, you know, when you say to a kid, is there a number bigger than infinity? They'll just say, oh, infinity plus one. And then and they'll then, say, oh, infinity plus infinity. Right? And they're not wrong. No. Yeah, this is kind of the, the, the thing, right? Infinity, as this was understood, this original infinity in, from the 17th century, infinity plus one makes no sense. Once you have put this into an actual concept in mathematics, it starts to... The question makes sense now and it has an answer. Right. So the reason, and this is exactly why we put omega and not aleph zero, because if you think about sizes, aleph zero plus one is just aleph zero. But omega indicates something else. So omega plus one is strictly greater than omega. So those are two symbols, in fact, for the same infinity in a way, but the context where you understand them is very different. I feel like when I, when I challenged you to tell me something that was Aleph 1, mm -hmm. you kind of gave me something. You said, okay, and it was to do with re all the different rearrangements of yes. the natural numbers. Can you do that for all the numbers? Like if yes. I start saying, oh, what's something that's Aleph 7 or what's something that's Aleph 48, that you could, yeah. you could construct something. It's exactly the same thing. You say, okay, take something of size Aleph 1, look at all the different ways you can rearrange it in, you know, in something called a well order, group them by type. How many types did you get? Aleph 2. This is how you get the next one. Okay. Right. All right. So it's just rearrangements of the rearrangements of the rearrangements. Yeah. 
Is this as big as infinity gets? It gets bigger and bigger until eventually you run out of sets. How can you run out? Exactly. We end up with kind of a concept like this, like this 17th century infinity, hmm. uh, although we refer to this nowadays as a proper class. So it's a collection that's too big to be a set, but we can still describe it and talk about it, you know, in a way. Um, because I guess all the different ways you're rearranging your rearrangements is tending towards something. Yeah. Just like the natural numbers were tending towards something. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. And there's some very good analogy between how we treat proper classes, which are this object so big they're not collections, or they're not sets anymore, they're not bona fide mathematical objects, and how you treat infinity if you're coming from the natural numbers. There's very good relationship between those two. Cantor actually gave that concept a name. He called it Taf, which is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. That one did not catch on at all. Uh, but he already knew that as a concept, it's kind of inconsistent, this kind of absolute infinity. Uh, so absolute infinity, I like yes. that. Yes. And so that's where this chain you showed me of the Alephs is heading towards yes, this absolute infinity. Uh, yeah, exactly. Or, and that's what Taf is as well. Yes. But again, nobody uses the symbol. There's no, yeah. Oh, that's a shame. A little bit. So what is the current biggest thing, the desk like, what is... What's the current thinking about if I said, well, where does this all end? What's the current granddaddy? So the thing is that you can ask, okay, uh, let me study a mathematical universe and ask about this kind of, you know, sizes that it has. And between different universes, one of them could have more than the other, or they might have the same ones, but disagree on, you know, where something falls or whether something is Aleph 1 in the one universe is actually Aleph 2 in the other, or maybe it's not anything. Now we're veering very deeply into mathematical philosophy, uh, and you want to ask, is there a one universe of mathematics? In which case, you just have all of this, you reach this absolute infinity, and you're done. Maybe there's a multiverse of mathematical universes, and then maybe they all have the same absolute infinity, and they just disagree on the placement. Or maybe there's just increasingly higher and higher absolute infinities, and whichever one you're working in has its absolute infinity, but you can move to the next one that has a bigger one. Because it feels like with these Alephs you were showing me, once you'd finished that yeah. process, finished in quotation marks, you could then just rearrange those ones. Right. And then, you know, like it just feels like you could just keep compounding it and compounding it. And yeah. Like... And here we get into kind of the, the, the subtle and, and very important issues in set theory about what is, you know, a set versus a proper class and why can we do this and not that. That's a whole other video. Let me ask you this. I'm not, I'm all about pure research, right? Sure. I don't care if this can be used to build a bridge mm -hmm. or send people to the moon, you know, I'm, I love that mathematicians think about things just for the sake of thinking about things. But I do kind of wonder where this is going, like what the point of this is, like, because it doesn't feel like it would even inform other mathematics. Well, it turns out that it really does. So, for example, uh, even if we just focus right now on what is this size? Uh, the two to the aleph knot. Two to the aleph knot, yes. So, it could be aleph one could be Aleph 2, could be Aleph 3, right? One of the axioms that you can add to mathematics, uh, and they're called forcing axioms, and we're not even going to touch that, they imply that 2 to the Aleph naught is Aleph 2. Now, on its own, this implication is not very interesting, but the forcing axioms themselves have a lot of useful applications that will affect things in analysis vaguely out there, but they do affect things in analysis, which then affect physics and engineering and eventually computing and building bridges with those computers. All of this study turns out to, to be way upstream from this, but it does lead you somewhere. And the way I like to describe this is this helps develop the language through which you can come up with ideas which will eventually influence mathematics. 
Sometimes when I talk to astronomers and people who study space for a living, I say to them, when you're talking about the distances to the planets or the distances to the stars or the distances to the galaxies, and you throw around these numbers mm. tri trivially, yes. do you think you really understand how big the universe is? When you're lying in bed, do you really think you're comprehending how far it is to Andromeda? Mm -hmm. Now I'm asking you, a set theorist who deals with infinity every day and throws around infinity like pieces of candy, <laughs> do you think you're really grasping the seriousness of infinity? So, that, that's a great question. Um, yes and no. It's kind of a double thing. Uh, on the one hand, you sometimes sit down and you're just overwhelmed by this. And, and it's just... And other days, if you close your eyes and you focus really, really intensely, you can see the differences. And you can understand in what sense this is smaller than the, the other and, and so on. These are even small compared to what I normally deal with. Um, other people in set theory will give you very different answers. The important thing is we have a definition that is very concrete and you can work with that definition. And if you do it carefully, you know you're fine. It feels to me a bit like when you were talking to me about the Alephs here, you're basically just taking infinities and turning them into normal numbers yeah. and then just doing powers and permutations and things and playing with them like they're normal numbers, they except are. they're infinities. Yeah, but they are normal numbers, right? Because what is a number? It's just an abstract quantity put into a concept. So this is just the concept of how many natural numbers are there, right? So let me ask you this. So we have seen that the real numbers are so much bigger than the natural numbers. Uh, okay, so the natural numbers are a subset of the rational numbers, half, you know, four quarters, which is one, uh, and so on, which are a subset of the real numbers. So we know that there's a jump in size between those two. Yeah. Where would you s say that this rational numbers, where, where would they sit? My intuition is that they might fit at the same level as the natural numbers. Mm -hmm. Why? Because... It feels like it feels like they're graspable or attainable in the way that the natural numbers are. Whereas the real numbers, there's always feels I don't know. The real numbers just feel more slippery. Right. The rational numbers feel more like I can get my hands on them. What's the answer? Well, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, the, there is in fact a way to put, you know, all the rationals kind of into the natural numbers in this kind of sense. So it's an aleph naught. Yeah. It is. Yes. So I'm right. You. Yeah, yeah. Well done. I, I keep telling you, you could be a set theorist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So even though, you know, because the intuition says like, well, okay, for every natural number, there's infinitely many real numbers, right? Between zero and one, there's a whole lot of them. But there's also a lot of rational numbers. In fact, between any two real numbers, there's a rational number. And yet, the rational numbers are so much smaller than the real numbers. And this is very mind-boggling. And a lot of people have a very hard time wrapping their head around this. And again, this is why we have concrete and specific definitions. And if you work with them slowly, eventually, you get used to them, as John von Neumann said. You don't understand things, you get used to them. And then it makes sense. The problem with that. If it's got a greater than zero chance of hitting that point, the same goes for every other point on the dartboard. And there's infinitely many of them. In fact, there's a big infinity of those mathematical points. When we add all those chances together to give us the chance that the dart's going to hit the dartboard at all, we end up with an infinite probability. We can't have an infinite probability. 